Would you like to find out what I got, when I, or what I found, rather, when I was going through some of my files in the office here? All kinds of things, but one in specific I saved out because I've talked about this thing and I haven't been able to lay my hands on it. Guess what it is? I've, I've referred to this numerous times on the programs. It's a physical item. Is it something with paperwork or is it something that's an actual? It's paperwork. I don't know. What is it? Do you remember when I've told you the story about being exceptionally embarrassed and mortified at a certain segment on TNA wrestling back in the 2000s? that not only Mike Tanay had to read, but that we were in the room with the Spike TV representative when this was read, and it was it jumped the shark, as they say, and I saved this whole format from the show. And for years, I had it sitting on top of it, and then it got put in a stack somewhere, and I haven't seen it, but now this is from Tooth... Wait a minute, hold on here. This is the actual format. It's the actual format of the show, Yeah. From July 9th, 2009, TNA Impact Show 441. We taped it, well, it was tape date 623 through 25. So we were, it was one of those mass taping deals. But um, I've told this story several times, and just recently, somebody referred to it, and we referred to it when somebody was asking one of the questions or whatever, but formats of wrestling shows have gotten ridiculous and out of control. And we've seen the one that was leaked. Was it a raw script? As they said on the internet here a while back, just recently. Yeah. A few WWE scripts recently leaked in the last couple of years. Don't use that word. That's for the marks. Marks use the word scripts, including the marks that work in the companies. Um, But the formats of TV wrestling shows have gotten ridiculous. And since the, start of television up through literally the attitude era, the formats of the shows that were disseminated to the crew and the production staff and, you know, whatever the case and shown to the talent, if it needed to be, and that, uh, you know, everybody worked off of were one and two page formats. It was, if, you know, if you had an hour television program, then depending on whatever, format you were using in whatever territory it was either six segments and five breaks or seven segments and six breaks otherwise you know it was an hour show which was actually either 58 30 or sometimes 58 58 or whatever that the particular station wanted or called for if it was a two-hour program like the clash of champions on tbs or the 605 saturday night program then it was two pages because it was 13 segments and fucking 12 breaks, whatever. You get my drift, right? And the format literally read open 30 seconds, desk or ringside, announcers, intro, billboard show, one minute, music, entrance, music, entrance, match, match, uh, uh, music on out, whoever the winner is gets their music played again, to VTR interview or whatever. And... That was so everybody knew what the flow of the show was and what was going where and whose music to play when. Because that's, you know, except actually music on out didn't tip you. Only that was later on in a smaller meeting when you would give a finish to the music guy and the producer and the director and they'd know which guy's music to play. But the reason it was done that way is because, number one, you see the flow of the show, you see what's coming on or what's coming up, but you don't get bogged down trying to look down at a page of typewritten fucking just endless copy and text and notes and script, right? If you're a producer or director in the truck, you don't need to see all that goddamn ridiculous paragraphs of verbiage from the interviews. Or if you're, uh, you know, just the wrestlers looking to see where you're coming up. You just need to see it instantly, right? Also, it didn't tip people off if they were left laying around that the whole thing was bogus and pre-written ahead of time. There weren't all the details, right? Nice and easy. And then verbally, the people that needed to know more information were told. Well, then 
during the Attitude Era when they started filtering the writers in and everybody got too big for their britches, they started trying to justify their writing positions by writing endless writing. And the format started getting bigger, and they started including more detail. And finally, it ended up this... What did I say? I've turned the page here. July 9th, 2009 format for the two-hour TNA Impact program on Spike TV at that time is 17 pages. <laughs> wow. Because the one person in the world with the most verbal effluvia coming out of his mouth and his typewriter and the most in need of justifying his position to himself and outsiders as being in charge of the writing was in charge of this. And so anyway, no, I, and I remember when we just talked about on the program, it was one of the drive throughs because somebody sent the question in. Mike Tanay. About Mike Tanay's, well, I've talked about his format reading voice, right? Well, this is my classic fucking representation of that. What we would do, and I, I apologize if I'm doing the setup here, people have heard this before, but bear with me because you'll get some new information here. But what we would do in TNA at the tapings at, at, uh, in Orlando is that you would get there about 11 o'clock in the morning and you'd have the production meeting. And once the production meeting was over, that's where you, all the shows that were going to be shot that night, you'd read through the formats in front of everybody. The director, uh, Dave Sahadi or Tim Walbert, the producer, Keith Mitchell, Shitstain was there on behalf of Creative, as well as Dutch Mantell and Jeff Jarrett. The announcers, Mike Tanay and Don West, uh, myself and whoever the agents were, if it was Savio Vega, if it was Road Dog, whoever the agents were, uh, other people in the television production, several of the other office people, Jeremy Borash doing the interviews. It's a small room. There's about 25 or 30 people packed into this thing. And when do you actually get the format? When you walk in the room, somebody, Ru Rudy Charles, the referee, uh, good old Rudy Charles is at the copier and he's copying off the formats because I'm always early, right? So if I would walk in 15 minutes early, he's still, he, I mean, you can smell the copy toner in the air. I love the smell of toner in the morning. And they, you know, deal them off like cards in front of everybody and you start making notes. And the idea is that you go down through the format or through the show from top to bottom and anybody whose department or who is, if you're the producer of a certain match or segment, if you've got a question about it, that's your time to ask. Or if uh, the sound guy is not clear on music, that's his to raise his hand. Or if somebody in their department, the announcers don't understand a point, wait a minute, should we make this point or that point? That's your time to ask it, right? Well, <laughs> that's the way it works in a normal fucking television wrestling production meeting, but a lot of these meetings, except for the one or two of the producers who knew that they weren't going to get their heads bitten off or yelled at or, you know, anybody rolling their eyes for prolonging this agony because they had a legitimate question. And, the you know, the main production people would ask something but normally everybody just wanted this shit to be over with because of the way that it had to be done in this particular way. And I will give you an example here in a second, the detail that had to be gone into at the start. And, uh, and obviously I would be the one and Jeff got a kick out of this. I'd be the one asking uh, most of the questions sometimes on other people's behalf when nothing was fucking clear. So to make sure that we didn't fuck up later on, and uh, that's why shit stain would look sideways at me and Dutch would giggle and Jeff would smile a little bit and Mike Tanay would give me the, the eye like, yeah, I'm really reading this. But Mike Tanay was the one that was nominated, as we've mentioned, to read through the entire format. That's why these meetings took so fucking long. And finally, as years went on, he started going on some of the pre-tapes. Well, uh, folks, you see it. You see the verbiage here. 
and get to the end. But because Shitstein was in charge of writing these formats, Mick Foley versus Jeff Jarrett versus Kurt Angle gets two-thirds of a page, right? <laughs> For the TNA World title triple threat fucking match that I was the producer of that was going to go somewhere around 12 minutes on television with this goddamn finish. Now I've got notes that I can't even understand. But that got about two-thirds, the same amount of space was given to a two-minute pre-tape. This was another one of Shitstain's brilliant ideas to put entertainment on this program. Abyss, who at one time could have been a money-drawing monster in the wrestling business, but did so much of this stuff in TNA that he was reduced to a goddamn cinder on more than one occasion, literally. Abyss was being psychoanalyzed by Stevie Richards. Brian, you remember this. Well, you might not remember watching it, but you remember me talking about it. Stevie Richards, the ECW wrestler, the WWF wrestler that everybody'd seen on TV for the previous 10 years, suddenly had become a psychoanalyst, and he's working on Abyss. You remember me talking about this. Yeah, I, didn't, I never saw this, but I remember you talking about it. Well, you're one of the lucky... How many people are in the world? Six billion? You're one of the lucky five billion nine hundred and ninety nine eight million seven hundred and fifty thousand people that didn't see this. They're doing these weekly things. Here's another thing. We have a national wrestling cable television program on Spike, right? And we have a lot of talent. I just mentioned Kurt Angle and Jeff Jarrett and Mick Foley and all this stuff, but we're still doing multiple shows in a soundstage at a theme park in Orlando with not a large technical crew, an office crew, and they have people wasting their time building this fucking doctor's office, a semblance of an of a, of analyst's office, and they hired somebody to be a goddamn receptionist, and they have a crew spending endless time while shit stain stands there like he thinks he's goddamn Francis Ford Kukula at trying to direct this shit. And it just bogged everything down. But the thing, the bigger problem I had was there's poor Mike Tanay in this meeting in front that I've just described in front of all these people in this packed room, including the representative from Spike Television, and I've gone blank on what his fucking name was. Nobody would know it anyway, except if you read the credits sometimes of the UFC shows. They had credit. He was on their, their credits. But at, in those days, Spike would send someone from the network to any of their first-run programming. I'm not talking movies, obviously not TV reruns, but the UFC or TNA wrestling, or whatever was being shot for their network new content, they would send a representative who would go to the product the taping, to the production meeting during the day, and then I don't know if he did this at UFC events, but the guy would sit in the production meeting, then he'd get to Orlando next to the fucking theme parks, he'd go play golf all day, and allegedly he would come back at night and watch the show to make sure that we're not trying to air the fucking Tijuana donkey show on his network. So he, you know, he report back to the muckety mucks. I never saw where he was during the show. Cause I was busy, the truck or the ring or the fucking locker room or whatever. He was allegedly there, but he's the guy that also did the UFC shoots. And I had to think that he had to be going back to those because at the time UFC was hot, as hot as it, you know, was getting there on television. He had to be going back and going, Jesus Christ, these fucking lunatics that run the wrestling program and this idiot that writes this show and they read this shit, right? It, it was just, it was embarrassing. I would sink down in my seat. So I want to read you, Brian, word for word, what shit stain put in a television format for a wrestling program on Spike TV that was going to be seen at this time by, what were the numbers then? 1.2 to 1.5 million people. It was doing better than 
AEW is now that everybody's remarking, oh my gosh, what an audience. And this was just old TNA. Of course, WWE was doing four times that, but he put this in a format, willingly had it read by poor Mike Tanay, the beleaguered announcer of this program, in front of everybody in the company, including the Spike TV representative. Are you ready? Yeah, I want to hear this. Okay. Pre-tape package, Abyss Dr. Stevie vignette, producer Vince Russo. And these are bullet points. There's like a little dot right next to these lines because he's, he, it's obviously he's laid this all out like he's Hitchcock figuring out vertigo, right? Abyss is waiting in the reception area of Dr. Stevie's office. He is pacing and pulling out his hair. The receptionist offers him some coffee to relax. Abyss drinks it. Coffee to relax. Abyss takes a seat. Dr. Stevie walks in. Abyss pops up, grabs Dr. Stevie by the throat. Dr. Stevie talks him down. <laughs> Dr. Stevie, quote, Relax, Abyss. I set up this meeting to resolve our issues. Nothing more. I didn't do anything to Lauren last week. That was another one of the girls that I don't remember what supposedly, I guess, Abyss was George Steele and she was Elizabeth, whatever the fuck. Yeah, it sounds like the coffee didn't help. Yeah, but moving back to the quotes here. Nothing. I didn't even move a hair on her head. She was never in any harm. I did what I did to get you here. Now, please, after 10 years, just hear me out just for a second. Abyss, let's go. Dr. Stevie, let's go in my office. Abyss walks in. Dr. Stevie makes eye contact with the receptionist and then follows him in. Inside the office. Dr. Stevie. Look, Abyss. This thing has gotten way out of line. No, I've gotten way out of line. The truth, the truth is that maybe I started becoming a little agitated with Lauren when I saw her getting in the way of our doctor-patient relationship. She was getting in your head, Chris. See, now it's a shoot. And she was telling you the wrong things, especially those things concerning me. I mean, who is she to judge, Chris? How long have you known her? What's the matter, Chris? Is something wrong? You look like something is wrong. Oh, no. Don't tell me that the drugs have kicked in already. <laughs> what? I, I thought I had at least another five minutes of babble I had to go through. You see, Chris... What I did was I ordered my receptionist to drop some blank in your coffee before I got here. Does it say blank in the folder? It is a bl it doesn't say blank. It is a blank. <laughs> he wrote this leaving a blank like somebody was going to find some real goddamn shit in the Amazonian rainforest that the fucking pygmies use instead of Karari to put on their blow darts that was going to have this effect. And he, and I brought up blank. I said, do, do we need to call the local medical facility to find out what this is? Well, we were going to look up a, what I, anyway, I'm continuing. Cosby was still free. You could have called him. We had seen nobody knew about it then. If only, I mean, you know, that <laughs> he going back to the script. I ordered my receptionist to drop some blank in your coffee before I got here. Do you know what blank is, Chris? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a drug that cuts off the blood circulation to every muscle in your body. <laughs> even, your th <laughs> even your throat <laughs> muscles, your voice box. It disables you, Chris, completely, almost turning you to jello. Oh, you can hear me, and you can understand everything I'm saying, but you just have no control over your muscles. So all you can do is sit there and do nothing. Do nothing when I do this, Chris. Dr. Stevie slaps Abyss. And do nothing when I do this. He hits Abyss again. And this. And again. Dr. Stevie violently attacks Abyss until he throws the cameraman out of the office and we can see no more. <laughs> wow. And he couldn't even come up with an imaginary name of the imaginary drug. That's what killed me the most. He left it for everybody to see that, we're, like, we're going to look this up. We're going to consult with somebody with a fucking 
pharmaceutical background and Road Dog was asleep at this time. Uh, he a took the drug. Background. <laughs> yeah. He and, took whatever Dr. No. Stevie had. No, I love I love Road Dog. <laughs> I love Road Dog. I'm just joshing with you. But anyway, the point is, it, this was read in front of the Spike TV representative, and then they did something highly approximating this and put it on the television program, which is another reason that this motherfucker ought to be stood up like a fucking firing squad victim and blindfolded. Um, and you say the spike representative was there in the end. That's what, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a while. That's what cost TNA their deal with spike was that they insisted you can't have him around anymore. And they yes, were still that's, <laughs> again. And then people were disputing that. Oh, it had nothing to do with it. Oh no, no. This kind of shit is what years later, they were laboring under the assumption that there was no more shit stain in TNA. And when they were alerted to the fact that Dixie had lied and that she was secretly employing him as a consultant for whatever the fuck, that was potentially the straw, as they say, that broke the network's back on all the other shit that they were already complaining about. And then they found out that they're lying to him on top of that. But yeah, the guy was sitting, and this is, this is one of the most egregious, but not by not by any length, the only ridiculous. I mean, I've talked about Shark Boy in the in the fucking fish tank that he lived in, but this is the kind of shit that and, and here's another thing. Because the another reason why that formats for wrestling shows didn't go into this much detail traditionally until this era and the writers got out of control and got too full of themselves and enjoying the smell of their own farts is also because this is before all this shit is shot. He would write shit that people were going to say in the ring live. He would write shit that was going to be, uh, people were going to be saying in pre-tapes. He would write stuff, the bullet points, even though he would not have anything to do whatsoever, as I've mentioned many times, with producing a match or with producing even an interview segment if it had physicality. He'd talk about the verbiage, but he wouldn't do anything related. So you had to go in and, and spell him on live interviews because he wasn't intelligent enough or didn't know enough about the business to be able to tell the guys how to do the physical part. So it was almost like, stop, stunt man, and somebody who knew wrestling would come in and go over the fucking fight, but... The reason why you didn't put down all this much detail is because then all the guys, when you would go to them and you would show and they'd go, if, if, I mean, Stevie and Abyss did this because they were on, they were uh, under the, the mesmerization of shit stain. But a lot of the guys, especially the ones I had to deal with because I was working with all the main event guys in their matches would in inevitably roll their eyes and go, what the fuck? You want me to say what? You want me to do what? And then either it would be changed. Sometimes even shit stain would change his own shit when he'd get in front of the boys and they'd have a better idea. But then you would have announcers assuming that things had been said that weren't said and they'd pitch to or react to stuff in pre-tape that had been changed somehow. Or you'd have people in the truck confused with what they were watching unfold in the ring in a match or an in-ring interview, because it wasn't that way in the meeting. Well, that's because the guys that were involved weren't going to fucking do that stupid shit. So they came up with something instead that was more palatable. And then we all had to go to Jeff and say, we're going to do this. Okay. Yeah, do that. That makes a lot more sense. So anyway, this is the kind of shit that he was fucking foisted off on not only the fans, but the people in the company that had to sit through this kind of thing. More questions. I heard you starting to break in a minute ago. Well, just in terms of what the actual segment was and how inappropriate it was, if you just break it down so that it's not tons and tons of dialogue to just being a sentence or two, Dr. Stevie drugs <laughs> and incapacitates Abyss, starts beating him up and then kicks the cameraman out. Yes. The cameraman who witnessed all of this. Yes. Uh, but when we come back... Oh. Um, 
Well, when we come back, we're going to a match with uh, Matt Morgan and Kevin Nash against Christopher Daniels and AJ Styles. So I guess fucking Abyss is just fucked. <laughs> Do you return to that room and to Abyss on the show? Um, hold on. I'll, I'll look through here. Oh, Lauren was the girl interviewer that somehow Stevie was inappropriate to. Wait a minute. Uh, the back car, but hold on here. Oh, well, see, no, because they come back after Abyss is drugged and mugged by his therapist. They go to that tag match I was talking about uh, where Christopher Daniels is severely injured. His ankle is severely injured. And then they go to the break and they come back and Sting and Samoa Joe are in the back. Lauren has a camera crew and she's going to try to get a word with Joe who has his back to us and is covered by a black towel. But the black car pulls up as the car stops. Samoa Joe goes around to the passenger side. He reaches in and starts strangling the driver, but it's not Samoa Joe. It's Sting posing as Samoa Joe with a towel over his head because they're so similar. <laughs> Come on. I did not think that's where you were going to go. And just before Sting can pull, just before Sting can pull the driver out, Joe, the real Samoa Joe attacks from behind getting big heat on Sting. But then security comes into the scene led by Mike Davis. Mike Davis. Do you know who that is? Wait, when you say Mike Davis, you mean the wrestler Mike Davis? Well, it, one of them. I mean, rock and roll RPM Mike Davis? No, the okay. other one, Mike Davis, Bugsy McGraw. Oh, no shit. Get the fuck Bugsy out of here. Bugsy McGraw lived in Florida, and wow. when he came by, and he, he was so big and impressive looking even then, they hired him, and this lasted I don't know how many weeks, and what I don't know what happened, but they hired him to be the head of security. And so... So basically, again, I want to remind everybody, Abyss has been drugged and raped by his therapist. Now, drugged and beaten. I'm sorry, not raped. Well, we don't know. The camera was kicked out. And then we had a tag team match where Christopher, in the very next segment, where Christopher Daniels' ankle was severely injured. But we come back after the break. Well, hold on. If all of his muscles stop working, why wouldn't he be dead? Well, it's because of the blank. Doesn't do that to you, Brian. <laughs> But we come back after Christopher Daniels is crippled <laughs> and Samoa Sting is posing as Samoa Joe who's strangling the limo driver until the real Samoa Joe comes out and gets big heat on Sting and then Bugsy McGraw comes out and pulls him apart. And then we go, as I mentioned, to Mick Foley versus Jeff Jarrett versus Kurt Angle. And the announcers note that AJ Styles has driven Christopher Daniels to the hospital during that match. Um, but we don't really know what the fuck's going on with, uh, well, well, we hold on here because now I've got a lot of notes on what actually happened and I can't read them because they're bullet points. And it was, this is almost 15 years ago, but what was supposed to happen according to the bullet points that were written by Shitstain. And that's why there's none of this in my notes. But the second that Kurt gets Mick in a submission, Eric Young, the referee, calls for the bell. Jeff Jarrett goes after Eric. Jeff and Eric fight around the impact zone. In the meantime, Kurt is getting more heat on Mick as the main event mafia comes to the ring carrying a roll of barbed wire. Samoa Joe is carrying Sting's bat and Kurt's belt. <laughs> the main event mafia <laughs> throw Mick's fallen body in the barbed wire in the middle of the ring. Kurt begins laying into Mick wrapped in the barbed wire with Sting's baseball bat. Then there's just one line bullet point. Heat. <laughs> <laughs> He's wrapped in the barbed wire with the baseball bat. He's got the belt. He's carrying the barbed... It's heat. <laughs> and oh then he, here comes... <laughs> God damn it. Security out. M M M M uh, lays them no well first big Rocco and Sally boy who was two of the local guys down there are really big guys that works as an independent team and they was trying to use them as some security but uh, personalities there for a while the main event mafia lays them out then security led by Mike Davis he just <laughs> start down the ramp armed with Billy clubs <laughs> so Billy clubs sitting. They're sending out seven or eight people led by Bugsy McGraw with a with Billy clubs. 
off hot before they get to the ring. So, um, apparently, what instead we did, because this these are my notes after we set, because Jeff is in this fucking match, right? And so, and Kurt Angle, so as I recall, I sat down with Mick and Jeff and Kurt, and here are my notes. Coming out of the break, the match has started the previous segment. Up on action, heat on Jeff, comeback, stroke. Eric Young slow count. Mick saves. Jeff stops Mick. Gets guitar. Eric Young stops it. Shove Eric. Socko on Jeff. Eric ditches guitar. Kurt Angle slams Mick. Two count Jeff save. Figure four, Kurt Angle. Mick elbow drops Jeff Jarrett. Mick cover Jeff. Kurt Angle gets angle, angle, angle lock, ankle lock on Mick. Face shot of Mick. That's a note for you. Oh, he don't want to tap, but he's got it. He's in the ankle lock saying no. As soon as we get the face shot of Mick saying no, Eric Young calls for the bell and announces the winner. Eric was on the goddamn take. That was a match involving Kurt Angle, Mick Foley, and Jeff Jarrett, main event talent. They fiddled with the guitar. Kurt's using his angle slam and his ankle lock. It's every man for himself, and there's a crooked referee that's in the pocket. We have rolls of barbed wire security with billy clubs, people carrying. And, and also, there wasn't Sting and Samoa Joe because, goddamn, if we last recall, they should they should be in the fucking local Orlando jail by now because they're having a fucking <laughs> brawl out in the parking lot. He's strangling limo drivers. What well, said? That's a th this show would change constantly because. Goof would just have diarrhea all over the paper. And and then when it came to actually doing it and talking people into doing these things, it changed drastically. But but no, to answer your original question, I guess Abyss was just fucked because we didn't hear from him for the rest of the program. How many of these TNA formats do you still have? Uh, how many shows was I at? However many that was. Hold on, I'm trying to... We can have fun with they, this. They <laughs> we can have a lot of fun side. with this. Because <laughs> no. I have... And see, the thing is, the formats were better and, and easier to understand back in the old days, but I have my WCW booking committee formats. I have... I don't know, to be honest, I've got to go back, and I'm sure I don't have all the WWF formats because I just... Besides the... Think about, I was there for three years, and we were doing, every week we'd do Raw, we'd do two or three syndications, that was before SmackDown, it would be in the thousands of formats, and I wasn't that interested, but I have all of my OVW formats, all my Ring of Honor formats for anything that I was involved in writing, the, the TNA formats that I saved that... I just, I couldn't believe, well, as a matter of fact, well, hold on, the earlier uh, segment one Mick Foley and Jeff Jarrett live interview is an entire page of verbiage. He had another rule that the pre-tapes all had to be two minutes because we weren't giving the pre-tapes enough time to fully develop the stories so that he was having... Three minutes, six man tag matches in the ring, but pre tapes had to go two minutes. We always hear about how him and Jeff were so close. Let me hear how he wrote for Jeff. Do you have anything he wrote for Jeff? Um. Well, I don't know how this came off. Yeah, I've got it. Jesus Christ, it'll take me the rest of the program to read this. I don't know what was actually said on this program, uh, but this is what he wanted uh, to be said. Uh, mix in the ring. Mick. Says, Jeff, I said I'd be back this week, and here I am. We can go round and round, but the truth is that TNA isn't designed to have two officers making the decisions, especially when those two officers have two totally different agendas. So, Jeff, let tonight be the night that one of us steps down from our position in TNA. Because Mick had become another one of the authority figures at this point. This was after I was an authority figure. Then they decided to, to let everybody know that Jeff was the founder of TNA. This is toward the, you know, the uh, the bloom was July 2009. The bloom was fixing to come off the rose. This may have been the last taping 
Jeff made now that I think about it. <laughs> anyway, founder, uh, TNA founder, music and entrance. And he also would have to, in parentheses, put which side they were coming out, the baby face or the heel side. Anyway, Jeff says, Mick, I have to ask you, do you ever for one second consider anything you say or don't you? Look, you and I are competitors, and I totally understand that once you, once you were back in the fire, you just wanted to revel in that glory one more time. I understand that, Mick. I've been there. It's the nature of the beast. We're wrestlers. That's what we do. So in the process, you have proven to the entire world that you still had what brought you to the dance in the first place. You became the TNA World Heavyweight Champion. Should that have been the end of the story? And by the way, I'm putting a lot more oomph in this than Mike Tanay would do when he would read in his monotone voice because he couldn't be accused of judging anything. He couldn't... How would it sound? You keep talking about his monotone voice, but how would it sound? Do it. Okay. Should that have been the end of the story? Probably. But for whatever reason, you felt that wasn't enough. <laughs> you had to put TNA in severe danger in order to get a rematch for that title. Mick, listen... You have nothing to prove, not to me. Because if he was, if if Shitstain had heard the verbal eye rolls, if, if he put the inflection in when he was disgusted with something, it'd have been an issue. Anyway, uh, you had to put TNA in severe danger in order to get a rematch for the title. Mick, listen, you have nothing to prove, not to me, not these people, certainly not to Kurt. We'll all be in your corner at Victory Road, and regardless of what happens, you will always be a true legend in all our minds. But Mick, you need to start thinking. You need to remember what happens. Or you need to remember why you... See, the print is so small you can't follow the line. Why you came to TNA. You need to consider all our young athletes and the families that depend on each and every one of them. That's why I brought you here in the first place. That was our goal. But I'll tell you right now, if the main event mafia walks away with all the titles at Victory Road, I'm not so sure we can overcome that mountain. Mick, what I'm saying is that we can fix this, but we can only do it together. And they go back and forth. I, I can't even read this anymore. Uh, it, it, Jeff shakes Mick's hand. Mick's on the team. But Jeff says, why wait to turn this around at Victory Road? Why don't we start tonight? What do you have in mind? How about together you and I book a match? Maybe Kurt Angle in action. Sounds great. Mind if I tweak it? Be my guest. How about Kurt Angle versus Jeff Jarrett? Jeff says, sounds good. But I'll tweak it. How about Kurt Angle, Jeff Jarrett, and Mick Foley in a three-way? And Mick Foley, I smell ratings, Jeff. But in the event of fairness, I say we let Kurt Angle name a special referee. Jeff says, sounds good, as long as that referee isn't a main of, member of the main event mafia or Matt Morgan. And then they shake hands again. And then it turns out that Eric Young fucks the whole thing up. Oh, but it just... And on and on and on... I don't know if you would because it was a different time and things were different. Do you have any Mid-South formats from when you were there? Uh, no, we didn't get them. That's what I was thinking. Okay, that's why I said No, it fuck you. There was, <laughs> here's another thing. There was a, I made off with a couple of, of show sheets from the ring announcers and, and, and obviously Watts would send out memos from time to time and I have a few of those, but the format was for the booker the two announcers, the director in the truck, and whoever was sitting at the uh, at the uh, monitor in the locker room. And otherwise, there was a format for the show taped by the door that you had to walk out. And it was your job. And this was not just Mid-South. This was every other wrestling promotion in the world. It was your job to go when you got there, you put to TV, you put your bags down, you go over and look at the wall and you figure out where you're at, who you're working with, and and et cetera. So then, well, I mean, a lot of guys would just sit there and like bumps on a log and wait for somebody to tell them something. But that's the first thing I always did for the team, for the midnight. And if we were doing more than one television show, I would see how many times we're working. And also, are we coming up early? Then I'm going to need to, because in those days, Whoever the booker was, I mean, the usually at TV, wherever you were, the locker rooms were all together. Except if you were shooting on location in an arena, then it was a different situation. But for most territory TVs, and the booker would come and tell everybody what they were fucking doing verbally. Um, 
you know, the, like I said, you didn't get formats. You certainly didn't get your interview written down. Um, but at the same time, I would want to, if we were on early, especially, I'd want to be proactive and go find whoever the booker was and ask ahead of time, hey, since we've got two things or we're on early, and they would generally know what I was doing. They would give me the gist of the thing so I could fill the boys in a little bit. And then they'd have an official get together with everybody involved in our segment besides the Midnight Express. A lot of guys wouldn't do that, but I like to be prepared. Also, on some of those longer TVs, if it was possible to exit out the back door, if you weren't on till way late, you had time to set up your social evening in the parking lot. But no, guys didn't get formats because then they would leave them laying around. And even though there wasn't who's going to win the match or anything indicating that it's a predetermined program, you didn't want your paperwork floating around. So, but, but that's another reason, as I said, why the formats in those days only had the match, who was being interviewed, you know, we go to the announcer desk, whatever. If it's the same thing could be said about boxing or the UFC or any sport or whatever, there was nothing on the format to indicate that there was any advanced knowledge of what was going to go on on the program on anybody's part. I have another question I want to ask you about the format, but first I want to ask you about your healthy breakfast. What did you have for breakfast today, Jim? Well, I'll tell you what I had for breakfast. <laughs> That's the same thing that I have for breakfast every time I have breakfast because you just can't beat it. It's like a broken drum or a sore dick. You just can't beat the magic spoon, folks. And it's a new year. If you've got the New Year's resolution going or if you've maybe postponed the New Year's resolution until Valentine's Day, whatever the case, if you want to eat healthier, if you want to save time in your morning routine, you can do all these things with Magic Spoon because it's not only the best tasting cereal in the world, it's also free of all the sugar and the junk and the carbs that you can't eat anymore now that you're an adult. And also, it's quick. Just throw some in a bowl, pour some milk on it, or you can throw some in a bowl and just eat it like trail mix, or you can actually just Take the box with you in the car on the way to work and just sit there, drive with your left hand, stick your right hand on top of the box and eat shit like popcorn. That'll work too. Just whatever you do, number, well, two things. Number one, make sure you wipe your hand off before you scratch your nose or before you drive or elsewise, if the cops pull you over for driving with one hand and you've scratched your nose and you got all the, the fine sugary goodness that doesn't have real sugar in it, on your nose, they'll think you're coke to the gills. Why are we going down this road, quite literally and figuratively, now that I because say that? Because you don't want to do that. You no. want to drive safely. Just enjoy your magic spoon in a regular, safe environment. Yes. Uh, stress regular, someplace you would regularly be, like your kitchen. Well, you're regularly in your car. Just don't let the cops see you driving with one hand while that other hand is stuck in a box of magic spoon. The, the, the flavors alone... <laughs> <laughs> cocoa fruity frosted peanut butter blueberry cinnamon cookies and cream and maple waffle and boy if you mix all those together i've been i've i've been made to understand that it's somewhat like the the mushrooms that grow under turds in the desert if you mix all these flavors together you'll see magical rainbows and unicorns but you can try it for yourself build your own custom box the custom bundles are available at Magic Spoon, and of course, all the all the various flavors and types and kinds, categories of the cereal have zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs in each serving, only 140 calories per serving. So if you want to, you can have two servings. Just be a double fister. Stick both hands in the box of Magic Spoon and just pull up handfuls of cereal and shove it in your fucking face. Just watch out. Don't get anything in your eyes. And you'll still only be eating 300 calories. Even if, if you were to tie a sack around your neck like a horse on the, on the farm and you just stuck your face into a whole goddamn sack full of Magic Spoon, I bet you you wouldn't be able to eat 1,000 calories before you passed out. This stuff is healthy as shit. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. So, folks, go to magicspoon.com slash Jim, I bet that's what some people would like to do to me right now, 
magicspoon.com slash Jim to grab a custom bundle and start your new year off right. Use the promo code Jim at checkout. Save $5 off your order. And of course, don't forget about the 100% happiness guarantee. If you eat a box of Magic Spoon and are immediately not 100% happy in your life and your relationships with all your friends and your job and everything, then they will refund your money. No questions asked. If you don't like Magic Spoon, the delicious cereal, they'll refund your money. Oh, you got to have 100% happiness on the Magic Spoon or they'll refund your money. But you can still be a miserable, sorry sack of shit in all other aspects of your life. But if you don't like this cereal, and you're not going to get any money back on that, folks. But if you don't like this cereal, they'll give you your money back. So this is the best bet in life. What? A, hey, let me ask you this. If you're mad at your wife and you're miserable, you don't like her, is she going to give you all the money back that you spent on her? Fucking gum bumping bipolar bitch. Hey, how about? Well, who, I'm telling you what. Who, you, who do you have a problem with today? <laughs> how about? <laughs> how about your neighbor? How about your neighbor? The fucking guy comes over and bars your goddamn lawnmower, keeps it for six months, and brings it back on empty. You're not happy with him. He's not going to give you that gas money back, but Magic Spoon will. How about your kids? You're delinquent howl at the moon kids. You spend all that money on school. You spend all that money on training them to be upstanding citizens. What are they? They're delinquents. They're out roaming the streets in gangs. They're not going to give you that money back, but Magic Spoon will. See? Magicspoon.com slash Jim. Use the code Jim to save $5 off, and it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. You'll be happy about your cereal. Everything else, fucking crapshoot.